All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to It's Worth a Shot. Today, we have a presentation from Hawaii. Um, she's going to talk about enhanced barrier precautions. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. This is just a reminder that um, our presentation may contain information from a third party, which today it does. And we're happy to have our guest speakers present with us today. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, just a couple of updates and reminders. Next week on Tuesday, we are happy to present oral health and nursing homes. Um, this presentation is going to be talking about oral health, dentition, um, the connection to sepsis. So make sure you guys get registered for that. It'll be a great presentation. Um, March is also kidney month. So we wanted to share some resources for um, kidney month with you guys. So there's a link in the slides. Um, the next two are from the nursing home behavioral health. There is a training tomorrow on opioid overdose and naloxone administration. And then March 30th is World Bipolar Day. So there's also some wonderful training from the Centers of Excellence. So make sure you guys tune into both of those. And then the last link there is the National Center on Aging Connect. And it's the uh, Older Adult Mental Health Awareness Day Symposium. So again, make sure you guys get registered. There's lots of wonderful training going on. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as always, we appreciate you guys' ideas about topics, um, so make sure you guys fill out the evaluation at the end. We appreciate all of your feedback. And Mary has put the link in the chat for you guys, and let's go ahead and do our polling question for today. All right. Are enhanced barrier precautions recommended for residents with C. diff? I'll give you a minute to fill that out. I was going to say it was a pretty good 50-50 split there. Okay, let's go ahead and stop it. Oh, still pretty close. So about a 50-48, 52-48 um, split there. So we are going to talk more about that. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. And we'll talk about our weekly influenza snapshot. As you can see, kind of across the nation, um, the respiratory illnesses are trending down. Um, there is a slight uptick on the mortality related to influenza. Um, and then our states, there's been an uptick for Wyoming. Um, it's in the high. Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii are all looking pretty good. And then let's go ahead and go to the next one. And we'll talk about our COVID snapshot. Um, Alaska has had a pretty substantial increase in our COVID cases. Um, our other states are kind of patchy. They, they've been stable. Um, there are some areas on the western side of Montana and kind of to the north that's had some substantial increase. Um, but overall for the nation, we've had a decrease in positivity um, and deaths and hospital admissions. So looking good. Um, COVID vaccines and influenza vaccines are still available. So make sure if you guys haven't received those or if you need assistance with those, let your account managers know. And now I'm going to turn the time over to Jolene. She's going to introduce our presenter for today. All right, very good. Thank you, Callie. Um, let me, all right. So I'm excited to introduce to you to two amazing people. Uh, first one is Denise Carvalho. She's an RN and is the infection <clears throat> preventionist and clinical education coordinator at Halimakua Wailuku on Maui, on the island of Maui in Hawaii. Some of her projects include wash in, wash out, hand hygiene program, and the revamped antimicrobial stewardship program. Denise enjoys teaching new hires and staff in fun, innovating ways to engage and promote team. Together, everyone achieves more. 
And the second person I want to introduce today is Viola Virus. She is uh, a 310 million year old virus. Her siblings include nudivirus and herpes simplex. They didn't get along very well. She is an opportunistic virus that used to wreak havoc in her prime. Nowadays, Viola Virus spends her days helping Denise and her team at Halimokua to avoid nudivirus, herpes simplex, and the superstar cousin, COVID-19, from stealing the show. Her motto is to make peace with the world and stop these family members from coming out of hiding. COVID-19, influenza, and RSV have to go. Denise, I'm going to turn the mic over to you and you take it from here. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Viola Virus. Nice to meet you all. Um, I am coming from Halimakua, Wailuku. And um, I am going to be Viola Virus for this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, here at Halimakua Wailuku, we, we had um, some interesting learning to do for um, enhanced barrier precautions because it's uh, mostly, we use it in nursing homes. Not very many other facilities know about it. Um, so what enhanced barrier precautions is, it's um, a precaution that uses the approach of using personal protective wear or PPE when we do only the high contact tasks um, to reduce transmission um, of multi-drug resistant organisms, MDROs. And um, that is in our skilled nursing facilities. But what are high contact resident care activities? Hmm. So that includes dressing, anything to do with touching the resident's body, skin, bathing, showering, transferring because of the close contact that you have with transferring, um, providing any type of hygiene, changing their linen, uh, changing briefs or assisting with toileting, and anytime somebody has a device. So um, anything like a pick line, midline, tracheotomy, um, ostomy, um, what else? Uh, feeding tubes. So all of these really um, cool gadgets that we have to help our residents thrive and get better um, does require us to have gown and gloves because we don't want to introduce anything to that device. Um, and also wound care. Obviously, whenever we have open wounds, there's an opportunity for wounds to be flourished with um other bacteria and viruses. So we don't want to introduce any of that to the person and or give it to other people. So in general, we would use the gown and gloves for these types of activities only, right? Next slide, please. And this is our door sign. So um, enhanced barrier precautions is orange, bright orange. It tells us that we want to wash our hands before and after. So here at Halimakua Wailuku, we call that wash in, wash out. And basically before we even put on our PPE, we're washing our hands. Um, after we're done with care and removing our PPE, we're washing our hands again when leaving the room. PPE carts are included by the door or between doors if we have to share PPE carts. We have hand sanitizer stations everywhere that doesn't have an outlet above it <laughs> or below it. And then we have uh, dirty carts. So carts that can be easily wheeled around so that way people are not walking in their gowns or um, walking far enough to get a dirty cart. So everything can be easily disposed safely. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so why is EBP a challenge for many? So it's somewhat new, it's a new precaution. 
only found in long-term care and skilled nursing facilities. And it's only been since um, 2019, um, really, that it started. In July of 2022, CDC came up with the guidance for enhanced barrier precautions in nursing homes. How many of you knew that? That's pretty cool info, right? Um, EPP is confusing to the staff. When do we use PPE versus when not to? And what are the certain tasks that we use for this particular precaution? And I can't remember them all or some kind of, or some, some sorry, is some of the reasons why people um, don't know when to do it or, you know, have questions about it. Why don't I need PPE for feeding a resident? Why don't I need PPE for the delivery of food trays? Um, survey is still implementing how to assess EBP in our facilities. Um, so what it looks like in long-term care and skilled facilities is not quite, um, uh, I guess, the same or um, standard. So that's what EBP is trying to do is standardize and be... Uh, as simplified as possible, but also easily to easily um, able to um, administer, right, or to implement. Next, please. Okay, so this is last year's data, but um, this this year's data is looking similar. When I first started um, doing these auditings. Our PPE use, properly donning and doffing, that is, was significantly lower than it is now. So um, we were starting with like 75%, 80%. So a mix of this is because um, we were using PPE, but if you ask one employee when they are going to use their PPE for an uh, enhanced barrier precautions person, um, they would say, well, anytime I go into the room, even when I'm feeding them because I'm touching them. And then you'll ask another person and they'll say, no, um, I'm only using it whenever I do uh, showers and personal care. Um, but it wasn't consistent. So we, we were coming up with all these different answers and sometimes they weren't even using it at all um, simply because the supply wasn't available to them, like the carts weren't close enough to them, um, or that you know they ran out of gowns or gloves or something along those lines. So there were all these reasons why they weren't doing it in the first place. Um, so education was happening and we kind of climbed up to our 80s, 90s, and then in September, we just dropped off. So um, this was a time where we had new staff and um, they, they needed to be educated differently. So um, as an educator myself, I came up with all these new innovative ways to teach them. And um, that's kind of where Viola virus myself, <laughs> I came up with this idea of coming out and um, just kind of hiding in places, not in plain sight and just watching from afar and, you know, popping out of nowhere to see if um, they were putting on their PPE properly and taking it off. So October, November, December, we started to look more steady. January and February, we actually look very steady. So, um, I would say 99% of people are using it properly. And when they're not using it properly, education takes place on the spot. Okay, thank you. All right, so our PPE compliance, this is for 2024. Um, like I mentioned, we're looking at, you know, 99% at this moment. Um, what's the great thing about this is we also have the staff teaching other staff so they can actually verbalize what they need to be doing for our enhanced barrier precautions rooms. And as an educator, it makes me really proud that not only are they doing it 
themselves, but they're also teaching and they can support one another and be confident that they're doing the right thing for their the residents. So um, these numbers definitely show that we're heading in the right direction. Next. Okay, so hand hygiene is most important in all of this. If we do good hand hygiene, we can prevent many, many, many illnesses and infections and diseases from entering our facility or coming home with us. So um, our hand hygiene it has been uh, kind of up and down, but for the most part, we have 99% compliance. This was as, as of last year. And um, we continue to teach on this. We continue to revamp our wash-in and wash-out program so that it's new and fresh and exciting. Um, and the staff also teach back as well. So when uh, I'm out there as Viola virus, um, you can hear the staff reminding new hires, wash in, wash out, wash in, wash out. You don't know who's watching. Um, so it's it's awesome to see them uh, washing their hands so frequently and just autopilot. And then the sound that you hear in the hallways, the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh is it's like a soundtrack of like ocean tunes, you know? <laughs> so thank you. Okay, and then this is our data so far. I don't know what happened to the January color, but we have 99% there. And then last month, 100% of our audits came back with good hand hygiene. Okay. The good news um, in our new hire orientations and competency trainings, we are um, teaching these concepts, um, building upon them, getting teach backs, and then also great feedback that um, the education is fun and exciting and they want to do it all day long and every month. Um, la this month, actually, we had a skills fair. Um, including games and actual touch and feel types of activities. Um, it went really well. The staff want to have skills fairs every month. Um, unfortunately, skills fairs can take a lot of work. So um, I promised them, you know, every quarter or something, we could do something like that. Also, we have our enhanced barrier precaution sign, or I'm sorry, our identification cards from Mountain Pacific. 100% um, of our staff now wear them on their IDs. And I remind them that it's not cheating if you look at it and refer if you need clarification on when to use a gown and gloves for your residents. Also, um, we're doing enhanced barrier precautions in services with myself, Viola Virus, um, and on the spot training and surveillance. The interdisciplinary team, IDT, is helping me with audits every day, including weekends and shifts, all shifts, to um, watch hand hygiene and PPE use, wiping down equipment, other things like that. Um, we have infection control rounds, presence walkthroughs every morning at the change of shifts. Um, we have EBP quizzes, and, and we um, just make it fun and as a little reminder as to what to do in your day-to-day -day activities with your residents. Um, also, I've created EBP tickets as well as hand hygiene tickets when um, I see non-compliance. I don't give it the first time, but if it's a second or third time, and I've already told you that you need to be wearing a gown or performing hand hygiene, then you get a ticket. So if you accumulate three tickets, the supervisor um, is recommended to write you up. As an educator and infection preventionist, I can't write people up, but I can recommend it to their supervisors, um, which is unfortunate, but um, three strikes and you're out, right? No. Weekly and as needed emissions, 24 hour reports. Um, we go through that every morning as well as um, weekly. So I look at the EBP transmission-based precaution assessments and implementations 
Uh, we've been care planning and putting it in our banners when someone has transmission-based precautions, such as EBP. And then, of course, EBP signage is up, huddles are discussed. Um, so I've really integrated a great deal of things so that it's never forgotten on what to do. Um, and I work with the teams every day to make sure we're on top of it and that they understand it. Okay, next. All right, so this is Viola. This is me. I keep forgetting I'm Viola, but I'm Viola. And this is the tools. This is the sample of the Enhanced Barrier Precautions card um, that we've been using. And um, in the picture, I'm holding the wash in and wash out sign and some of my tickets that I've been giving out. Um, I don't give out as much as I did when I first created these tickets, um, which is really cool. Um, next slide. Um, a sample of um, another Mountain Pacific tool um, about enhanced barrier precautions. This is just expands on things if I have to educate further on the use of gloves and gown. And then the second tool is about um, implementing the enhanced barrier precaution. So these quizzes are mostly given to our new hires um, and staff that are non-compliant also get this quiz. Some samples of our violation tickets, um, potential survey violation. <laughs> so these are just two of them that I, I give out um, for staff to be, um, you know, alerted that, oh, someone's watching them. Um, and they don't take it negatively. They're just like, oh, right, sorry. Um, and, you know, they, they do better the next time. So it's, none of it is a punishment. Okay, the bad and the ugly. So the bad, when we first started, um, hand hygiene wasn't really working out as great. Um, we didn't really have a good auditing system either. So it, we had to first start with hand hygiene. If we can get everybody to wash their hands um, frequently and without being told, then we can build upon um, the other infection control precautions that we needed to keep in mind. Um, so first we had to do hand hygiene and then second, um, we suggested that we work on just the staff reading and looking at signs before they just go in the room. Um, we also had to deal with some bad habits, wearing the PP PPE outside the room. Um, day shift CNAs were kind of the ones that were doing it initially. The ugly, um, in 2023, we had a lot of people double gloving and triple gloving. Um, so that had to get stopped, um, not using PPE at all the wound care or Foley care types of cares, um, no hand hygiene that followed. And night shift was actually the biggest group of people that we had to teach for this particular incidence. Okay, and this is my contact information. Uh, my name is Denise, and um, Viola Virus is my assistant slash um, alter ego. Does anybody have questions? Denise, hi. Question? This is Joe. I have, oh, this is sorry. Joe. Sorry. Um, how long did it take you, um, Denise, to uh, from beginning till today to... Um, it, it, drive change with your team? Denise, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I forgot. I muted myself. <laughs> um, it took about six to eight months, really, to get the, the change to, to start, um, only because I was new to Holly Makua. Um, so in, in the past, like, We've had educators and um, infection preventionists come in and, you know, they 
they had other things that they were prioritizing. And then I come in and my prior, my priority is to have good hand hygiene and understand EVP. So that was um, one of the challenges was to switch um, kind of a, an urgency type of um, focus, which was COVID and, um, you know, preventing COVID from taking over to, you know, let's focus on the basics, hand hygiene and understanding enhanced barrier precautions. Um, and then let's build up upon it. So it, it took about six to eight months, but um, I'm coming up on a year next month. So um, I only feel that it's been successful because of the team approach that we have here. Um, I'm not alone whenever I'm teaching. So my, my DON, Jerry, and others have been kind of like the back, the backbone of making sure that we are um, supporting these efforts and helping our staff. Thank you, Denise. Another question in the chat. Does PPE need to be used with device care and wound care even without MDRO? Yes. While they have the devices and while they have an open wound, the answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? You can mute, unmute yourself or drop them into the chat. Yeah, I have a question. This is um, Kay in um, Alaska. Um, what about quality of life for our residents? Because that's, you know, we implemented some components of enhanced barrier precautions, but not all of them, you know, because if you follow it fully for the CDC, you know, during all transfers, during, um, you know, I mean, it's almost all the time for some of these people and it's going to be for the rest of their lives. So, I mean, if they have indwelling devices or, or whatnot. So we, um, you know, trying to find that balance of, of quality of life for these residents and then what's best for them. So how, how has that worked for you? Well, EBP residents are not confined to their room. They can leave their room. Um, it's not like all the other precautions where they have to stay in their rooms. So um, in that sense, we teach the residents too. Like, you know, the reason why you're on enhanced barrier precautions is because of X, Y, and Z. Um, but we do encourage you to wash your hands and you know you can you can do what you want in in your free time, but just remember to wash your hands, because uh, that's really what it is. It's it's just educating them on little things like washing hands, um, and reminding them that we're we're only protecting them in the way that they would want to be protected in the community. So. Um, it's not like we're confining them. It's just protecting them when it's most important. So this is Pamela in Ketchikan, <clears throat> and you may have shown this and I missed it. Have you seen a change in your MDRO rates? Um, yes, um, we've been receiving less MDRO residents. I mean, from time, from time to time, maybe we have like, uh, we have a positive ESBL right now, but they're all community. They don't come from our facility. So you've not seen any change in your rates within your facility that weren't present on admission already? Actually, you know, and let me reframe my question, my answer. We we didn't have any MDRO um, that came from our facility. They, they all came from the community. So anytime we have them, they they already had it in their diagnosis. So none of them come from our facility. Okay. And I know I I missed our survey this year. They came while I was at the wound care certification training um, last week. But when I had asked the uh, Alaska state surveyors about um, the precautions when they were here the year before, they said that our state would never support those, um, mm. that they just... Um, I was like, oh, oh read these. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's interesting. Has anybody else heard from the uh, Alaska surveyors as to what their thoughts are in um, including EBP and in survey? So we were just um, surveyed in Sitka and cited for yeah. it because we did not follow it to a T. We just chose 
to use it during um, like for for a catheter resident, for instance, only during catheter changes and, and high risk um, activities, not for transfers, not for bathing, not for all the other components listed on that CDC sign. So they did cite us because they said we weren't following what CDC was, but then we did an IDR and got it and it was removed um, because it's not required um, as long as we don't post that sign. So, right. So um, it, that's kind of like not following your own policy. Well, and it wasn't in our policy either. Right. So that was the thing. And that's why they removed it, you know, from the IDR. Um, but they didn't have a very good understanding of it either. We had to do a lot of education. Our infection control nurses educated the surveyors on what it was because they didn't fully understand that it wasn't a resident that was colonized. It was just a precautionary right. measure. And um, so I think there's a lot of learning to do still. Yeah. And as a long-term care CIC and a, you know, a CIC, I have to have some more literature about um, how it is preventing transmission of um, MDROs before I will be jumping off to do, I think, evidence-based or um, enhanced-based precautions here. I mean, we do have really good hand hygiene rates and we um, allow staff to wear PPE anytime there's a risk of potentially, you know, exposing your own clothes or um, anything else. And that's really, to me, the crux of, you know, when you need to use PPE rather than having um, protocols in place that say, you know, every time you do a catheter change or every time you do a linen change, or, you know, if they have a, an IV site, then you need to, you know, use a gown and gloves. So I think just more to be seen as more and more facilities roll it out and implement it, but nice job on your, your work there, your facility. Denise, one last question in the chat. How large is Hale Mokua? Oh, I just answered it in the chat, but it's okay. it's a it's a ninety bed facility, but um, we actually took out beds from the um, the four bedrooms and made them three, so that way we had more space. So it's actually an eighty bed facility, but we typically um, have seventy five to seventy six on an average day, maybe a little bit less. Um, at least lately, it's been a little bit less. So, um, but we do max out um, or get close to the max on a daily basis. Well, Denise, thank you so much for taking the time today to share us your story. And thank you, Viola Virus. Um, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to um, see you today and share your good, bad, and ugly with enhanced barrier precautions. Um, if you, you have Denise's contact information, and then Denise, if you want to drop your email into the chat again, uh, anybody else who has any follow-up questions, you can they can reach out to Denise, Denise directly. And then lastly is the evaluation uh, that has been dropped into the chat. So if you would please take a few moments um, to complete that evaluation, we'd appreciate it. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day.